Thank you so much, Rebecca. So hello and welcome. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy day to spend with me today to talk about the Fed. Um, I would like to thank um, Rebecca Williams for that awesome uh, introduction that she did. She uh, created a really nice press release that was in the, the Herald Tribune and um, she created a flyer for the event and um, that's not even her specialty. So she's a mathematician and a statistician. So, but she created a really nice flyer. Um, so thank you so much for that, Rebecca. And I just wanna thank Dr. Hyun Kim for creating this faculty lecture series years ago, which is really amazing that we get to hear from various faculty members about things that they're passionate about. Uh, the Teams people say the audio is not working. We just lost Philip. Okay. Oh, okay. You okay. You by mistake, sorry. Let's pause, I'm working on it. Oh boy, I hate technology, guys. Let's figure this out. I know my iPad's not working. All right, participants. Our biggest fear. I know, as soon as Philip left. Anybody know how to work Teams? Okay. Hmm? Sorry, I, I muted Kristen when I was trying to mute all the attendees. Let's see, Teams 3. Okay, let's see. Unmute this. Can you unmute yourself? Ugh. Let's see here. We're working on it. Manage audio and video. We got it. No audio. I hear you. I can't talk. Will there be like a slideshow or anything we can get online? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a recording actually. Yeah. So this will all be recorded. My oh, fumbling okay. around on yeah. Teams. Yeah. So look forward to that. Okay, um, all so sorry guys. Oh, it's fine, Rebecca. Please. We'll work through it. We will work through it. All right, how do I allow everybody to unmute? Allow. Mm, 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 mm. I think we got to do it from here. Okay. Can we do, can we back out of that screen? Yeah. Do the, yeah, click on this Teams right here. Okay. Think, and then on, yeah, this one. And then here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. All Excellent. Right, so let's test it. All right. So hopefully everyone can hear me now. So I was just introducing, and, I, and um, Rebecca did a wonderful introduction for me, and so I was thanking folks that uh, helped prepare this day together for the faculty lecture series, Dr. Hyun Kim, um, and also uh, Dr. Francis Auld on the Venice campus for um, getting that set up down there on the South campus as well. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, ask yourself, why are you here today? Well, I think we're all curious to know more about the Fed, the Federal Reserve System. Um, the Federal Reserve, their decisions impact us in, as individuals, as consumers. It impacts uh, students, businesses, the government. So it's pretty all-encompassing. And I think we're all just curious creatures by nature, and we want to know what this type of organization, how it affects all of us in every aspect of our lives. All good, Rebecca? Okay, excellent. Very, very good. So we're just curious by nature. And so today I really wanna focus on sort of an overview of the Federal Reserve System, some of the main parts of the Federal Reserve, debunk some of the myths that are out there. Um, there are many. Uh, <laughs> um, the Federal Reserve is very large, it's complex. It is very difficult to um, know all of the ins and outs of the Federal Reserve System. And so I kind of want to give you a little background and sort of a historical perspective on that today. All right. So the Federal Reserve is headquartered in Washington, D.C., only steps from the White House. It is heavily guarded. Um, so if you walk anywhere near the building, you will be escorted off very, very quickly. Um, I learned that when I was in Washington, D.C., and I wanted to get up close and personal. I said, but, but I'm an economist. It didn't really matter. Um, <laughs> so I saw a big gun, and I saw a guard, and I was quickly uh, escorted away. So they are headquartered in Washington, D.C., uh, as I said, steps from the White House. And that's where the Federal Open Market Committee meets to discuss the course of monetary policy for the country, for the economy. 
All right, so what the heck is the Federal Reserve? The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. So for short, it's called the Fed. So we don't want to confuse that with the Federal Bureau of Investigation or the federal government. For In short, instead of saying the Federal Reserve System, it's just known simply as the Fed. So a central bank, for the most part, oversees and regulates the overall banking system. So there are many, many different parts of the Federal Reserve System. So not only does the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, oversee and regulate the overall banking system, but it controls the monetary base. Monetary base is comprised of two parts, currency that is floating in circulation right now, and the number of bank reserves. So reserves refer to um, cash that's kept on hand at the bank, commercial banks that are member FDIC. All right, so other countries that have, <coughs> excuse me, a central bank that you're aware of, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, so major industrialized economies have a central bank that operates very similarly to the Fed, the Federal Reserve System. So we're not unique in that sense. Um, so the Federal Reserve has been around for a really long time. It was established in 1913. And we have to ask ourselves, what was the need to establish the Fed in the first place? So before 1913, there was a series of panics in the banking industry. So bank panics refer to widespread bank closures. And so with these bank panics, they were panicking, they were falling under, there was no FDIC, there was no deposit insurance. So if you had your money in a bank around that time, and the bank um, decided to make a risky bet or issue too many loans, then the bank could fail at that particular point. And you were just out of luck in terms of all the money that was sitting in your checking or your savings account. No deposit insurance whatsoever. Um, banks were called trust back then. They operated as mini monopolies. It was sort of the wild, wild west in the banking industry at that particular time. Very little oversight, uh, virtually no regulation. So if we think about that, the wild, wild west, among that period, the early 1900s, and we compare that to today, possibly there are some similarities that we can draw upon, but uh, there have been some changes. All right, so the Federal Reserve was established in 1913, and banks at the time were operating as uh, trust, which is another way to talk about a monopoly. And so um, since 1977, if we jump several decades into the future, the Fed has operated under what's called a dual mandate, and that's set by Congress. So the Federal Reserve is an independent institution. However, they are accountable to the federal government. They are accountable to the American people. So that dual mandate that Congress has, has set forth to the Federal Reserve System is twofold. Stable prices, keeping inflation stable. We'll talk about inflation um, a little bit further on in the presentation. And also maximum employment, which is very, very important. So maximum employment, the opposite of that statement would be um, low unemployment. So what are we seeing right now in today's economy? Well, right now we're seeing high inflation, but we're also seeing low unemployment. All right, so as I said before, the Federal Reserve is a independent central bank because uh, the monetary policy decisions do not have to be approved by the President of the United States or anyone else in the executive or legislative branches of government. So, as I said, the Fed is accountable to the public and Congress. And you're probably thinking, where does the Federal Reserve get their income from? The Federal Reserve's income comes primarily from interest on government securities that the Federal Reserve holds. We'll look at the Federal Reserve's T account. We'll compare the assets and the liabilities. All right. So the Fed consists of two main parts. And again, I'm saying the Fed, but that refers to the Federal Reserve System. So these two main parts are the Board of Governors and also 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. We'll look at a map here in just a little bit. So the FOMC, which is a long acronym that stands for the Federal Open Market Committee. So the FOMC is responsible for deciding the course of monetary policy for the United States. So who is able to actually sit, have a seat at the table and decide monetary policy? 
who actually gets to, to vote part of the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. So the Board of Governors, there can be a total of seven members of the Board of Governors. Right now there are only six, so there's one appointment that probably, I suspect, will be filled before President um, Biden leaves office. So that uh, the, the Board of Governors are um, appointed by the President of the United States with Senate confirmation. So sometimes it can take a while for all of those seats to be uh, filled. All right, so the Board of Governors, the president of the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank, um, and a fun fact, William Dudley, he um, is a bit of a local celebrity. He graduated with his bachelor's degree in economics from the New College right here in our area. And so he is no longer the president of the New York, of the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank, but he had a lengthy career um, working at the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank. So that's kind of an interesting fun fact. So the president of the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank always gets to have a seat at the table. Why? Because the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank is the largest out of the 12 in terms of the amount of assets. And then five other presidents that rotate and get to vote coming from those 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. So everyone eventually gets to have their vote and gets to sit on the Federal Open Market Committee. But the president of the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank always gets to have a vote. The president of the Atlanta Regional Federal Reserve Bank, which is the regional Federal Reserve Bank in our district, since we are in the state of Florida, um, Dr. Rafael Bostic, an African-American, he is very popular. Um, he is well-spoken. He's come to the University of um, Sarasota, USF Sarasota Manatee. He was here a couple years ago talking about um, uh, monetary policy and talking about the Fed. I was able to go and take a few of my students. We met with him after his presentation. We took a picture with him. It was really great. He's a, a brilliant um, a person. He's incredibly outgoing. He's very personable. And so he's really gained a lot of popularity in that um, he's just sort of seen as sort of the voice of reason at the, um, on the Federal Open Market Committee. All right. So what do they vote on? They vote on um, whether or not to increase or decrease uh, interest rates, the pi primary credit, the, another, known as the federal funds rate, and they also decide, are we going to increase or are we going to decrease the overall money supply for the economy? So big, big things for the economy. All right, so these 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, these 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks provide a central location for holding bank reserves. There are, last time I checked, a total of 76,000 commercial banks in the United States. So the Federal Reserve is the bank for banks. The Federal Reserve holds bank reserves at those regional Federal Reserve branches. Not only do they um, hold reserves of commercial banks, but they um, regulate, provide supervision, they provide various financial services such as check clearing, and they make sure that ample liquidity is provided in the economy during times of economic crisis. All right. so. What the heck is monetary policy? Monetary policy refers to actions taken by the Federal Reserve to help stimulate the economy. When the economy performs well, the saying is many other people perform well in the US economy as well. So with that statement, it is in the Federal Reserve's best interest to make sure that they are using the absolute best possible monetary policy to help the economy at that particular time. So there are two types of monetary policy, expansionary and contractionary monetary policy. Those are the two main types. Um, expansionary monetary policy, um, think about the word expansionary. That would be used to help expand the economy during times of um, economic downturn, during times of recession. And the Federal Open Market Committee, if they wanted to employ expansionary monetary policy, they would recommend lowering the federal funds rate, which is the primary credit rate, or increasing the money supply. Those are the tools that the Federal Reserve can use um, to help stimulate and expand the economy during an economic downturn. And the goal with that is to, how do we get overall aggregate demand in the economy? How do we get that curve to increase? How do we get consumers to spend money? How do we get businesses to want to hire workers? And how do we improve overall those expectations? So that's the goal with using uh, expansionary monetary policy. 
The opposite of that is contractionary monetary policy. And so when would we ever want to contract or slow the economy down? You're probably thinking, well, never. Why would we want to do that? We would only want to use the opposite contractionary monetary policy to curb high inflation or hyperinflation. That would be the only time when the Federal Reserve would literally want to slam the brakes on to slow the economy down. And so that would be the opposite. The Federal Open Market Committee would recommend raising the federal funds rate or decreasing the money supply. And of course, that would have the opposite goal. How do we shift that aggregate demand curve to the left to slow things down a bit? So you have to be cautious in terms of increasing or decreasing the money supply because that could actually contribute towards overall inflation. And so the Federal Reserve is, uses that, proceeds using that tool with caution. The primary way to utilize monetary policy would be to adjust the federal funds rate, increase or decrease interest rates. That's the interest rate that banks are encouraged to use. Um, if a bank falls short of their required reserves, they can borrow money from another commercial bank within that particular um, area. So through interest rates. So in order to, if we go back to expansionary monetary policy, in terms of lowering the federal funds rate, the goal behind that is how do we lower the federal funds rate to free up money for banks to make additional loans in the economy for consumers, for small businesses, um, and any other type of loan that you and I would, will um, be interested in having over the course of our lifetime. And then uh, raising the federal funds rate, that would be to discourage borrowing money. So that's just a little bit of a background on that. So this is monetary policy, the two types. Let's ask ourselves, what the heck is the Federal Reserve currently doing? What type of policy are they currently using? So what the Fed is currently doing now is keeping interest rates low. Interest rates being that federal funds rate. The Fed is unsure um, you know, when they will actually decide to raise interest rates, right? Because it's a very touch and go situation. And so they firmly believe that the current inflation that we're experiencing we're all aware of it, right? The current level of inflation, they firmly believe, is transitory. And it is solely due to uh, the, a lot that's contributing that towards the pandemic and the global supply chain that we're dealing with, which I'll talk about further on. All right, so the, the target rate for the Fed, they like to see inflation at or around 2%. We're at 6.2%. So, okay, what does AD mean again? Aggregate demand. Okay. Very good question. Um, so if we had to think of a picture, this is what inflation looks like currently. So this is the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And we have never seen cargo stacked as high as it is stacked. We have never seen ships waiting out in the ocean waiting for a spot to free up at these ports. And so if we can't get the goods to these warehouses so that businesses can actually sell these goods to other businesses and to consumers, of course that's gonna drive up prices of those existing goods and services. So there's a shortage of goods right now, primarily with goods, not so much with services, but with goods in the economy. And anytime there's a shortage of a, a product, that's gonna cause prices to rise. So this is what the picture of inflation looks like. And I chose to focus primarily on the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach because those are deemed you know, some of the busier ports in the United States. Roughly 40% of all goods coming from foreign countries are coming through those particular ports. That's a lot of goods. So based on where we live in Florida, chances are we're, our goods are not coming in, in from Los Angeles and from Long Beach. We have the Jacksonville port, we have Miami, of course, and we have Savannah. So we have some other uh, ports that are significantly closer to us. So that's where our goods and services are coming from, um, from all over the country. All right, so that's just a really telling picture to me whenever I, I see that. All right, so the Board of Governors. So there are a total of seven board members that can serve on the Board of Governors. The current chair of the, um, of the uh, Fed is Jerome Powell, and we have a couple other um, 
members of the board, uh, Lael Brainard to the left of Jerome Powell and Michelle Bowman to the right of Jerome Powell. All right, so as I said, there can be a total of seven members of the board of governors who are appointed by the president of the United States with Senate approval. Um, you wanna really take your time in selecting these members because they, they have a really long term limit. So that's important. So each board member, board of governors serves a 14 year term. That is incredibly long if you think about it. So each serves a 14 year term. However, the chair of the Fed serves a four year term with possible reappointment. So keep in mind that the president of the United States is elected for four years with possible reappointment. Let's think about why the term limits are the way that they are. So right now we have a healthy mix at the, the Federal Reserve System of Republicans and Democrats. And guess what? Politics doesn't really matter at that level because they're solely interested in what's best for the overall economy. And when everyone's doing well in the economy, then that is certainly a win-win. So it is very important to have a mix of Republicans, to have a mix of Democrats, and even independents, right? We don't want there to be one viewpoint, right? Or we don't want it to, the vote to sway one way or the other. So there's a nice healthy mix um, in terms of the Board of Governors. All righty. <clears throat> and those current term limits ensure that that uh, mix actually occurs. Okay, so does this person look familiar to you? Does the name ring a bell? It should, it definitely should. So Janet Yellen, the vice she was the vice chair of the Board of Governors from the years uh, 2010 to 2014. She was also the first female ever to chair the Federal Reserve since it was established in 1913. She was appointed by President Obama in 2014 with Senate approval to become the chairwoman of the Fed. Um, her appointment was, she was not reappointed by President Trump. So President Trump appointed Jerome Powell, the vice chair to replace Chair Yellen in 2018. So Jerome Powell is, um, I think he's done a phenomenal job as chair of the Fed. So he was uh, vice chair at the time when um, President Chairwoman Yellen was the chair of the Fed, and they had a very, very close relationship. They still do to this day. She's a Democrat, he's a Republican. Again, at that level, it doesn't really matter what your politics are. The goal is, how do we stimulate the economy? That's the most important thing, right? And so, um, yeah, they, they get along very well. Uh, she's married to a famous economist, George Akerlof. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in economics. And so just imagine what those uh, conversations at dinner are like. <laughs> so he won the Nobel Prize in economics in uh, the year 2001. So it's, it's pretty interesting to think about um, in the, within the economics profession, because I go to a lot of conferences and I participate in a lot of professional development, there are plenty of uh, women in the field. There are plenty of men in the field. And it's become more and more diverse over time, which is just kind of interesting that there's only been one female to chair the Federal Reserve System since it was created, since it was established in 1913. And um, she served a, a four-year term as chairwoman of the Fed. And um, her career's not over with yet. She's currently, she's been appointed by President uh, Biden. She's currently the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, which is, again, a very, very big deal. So her career is not over with. Okay, so the second main part of the Federal Reserve System, we've talked about the Board of Governors, um, a lot of facts to know about the Board of Governors, and then the other main part are those 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks and their districts. So these banks issue currency, they provide financial services to banks in the economy. A fun fact is all checks, every single check that's written in the United States gets funneled and cleared through the Atlanta Regional Federal Reserve Bank. That is a fun fact. Well, if you think about it, um, once upon a time, uh, checks were cashed at all of the 12 Regional Federal Reserve Banks. There are some students that um, have never seen a check, have never seen a checkbook. They don't know how to write a check because um, the usage, the demand for writing checks has sort of slowly diminished over time. And so we really only need to funnel and clear all checks that are written in the United States are funneled through um, the Atlanta Regional Federal Reserve Bank. 
and that is ours. So um, each note can actually be identified by coding on the face of each bill, which we'll look at in further detail. So the coding is very unique. Um, we've got A1, Boston, B2, New York, C3, Philadelphia, D4, Cleveland, E5, Richmond, F6, Atlanta, G7, Chicago, H8, St. Louis, I9, Minneapolis, J10, Kansas City, K11, Dallas, and L12, San Francisco. So if, let's suppose that, Rebecca, let's suppose that you decide that um, you need cash. And so you go to the bank um, on your way home uh, from work this evening and you swing through the ATM and you get brand new currency from that particular location. Sometimes we get brand new, fresh, clean, crisp bills. Other times we get older um, currency notes. If those bills are brand new, they're gonna have an F6 on them. They're gonna have an F6. 100% they will be coming from the Regional Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. If it's an older currency, um, that can be coming from anywhere. If we think about how fast money travels from one hand to the next, from one business to the next, you can wake up in Sarasota, Florida, have a business trip in San Francisco, and that's how quickly money travels if we're paying with cash. It's really a remarkable process. So you're probably thinking, why are there a couple of banks that are highlighted? Is any good economics nerd, I've visited those um, regional Federal Reserve Banks, and each of those regional Federal Reserve Banks are open to the public. You can take a tour and you can learn all different types of facts about money and um, monetary policy in the Federal Reserve System. So I've been to the Boston Fed, the New York Fed, Richmond, Atlanta, Chicago, and Minneapolis. I had to go to the Atlanta Fed. That's the one that's in our, our region. So take a look at, at, at how those districts are drawn. And think about population. There is a very um, small cluster in the Northeast because it's very densely populated. Some states actually um, utilize, depending on if they're north or south, east or west, they actually utilize more than one regional Federal Reserve Bank for services. And if we look at L12, that encompasses a very large geographic location, including Alaska and Hawaii. Okay, so how do we identify? If you have any money, if you have any money at all, um, you can, you can um, take it out and, and take a look at it and we'll identify where that, where that currency is actually coming from. Um, I hardly ever carry cash on me anymore, but if you have some Federal Reserve notes with you, you can get them out and you can identify uh, where those Federal Reserve notes were issued. So we've got the $1 bill and the $100 bill. So what's unique to the $1 bill is the coding. The letter shows up on the left-hand side, and we see the letters 1 in each of the four corners on the, the front of that $1 Federal Reserve note. So we see A and we see 4 one. So that tells us that that bill was issued by which Federal Reserve Bank? Boston. Boston, absolutely. And then we see the $100 bill. So only with the $1 bill and the $2 bill do we see the letter on the left side with the numbers in each of the four corners. The $1 bill and the $2 note. With the fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and one hundreds, it only shows up in one place. And that is the top left corner. With this $100 bill, we see A1. So again, that tells us that that was issued by the uh, Boston Regional Bank. So just to sort of give you an idea, that's how we keep track of all of the money. All right, so I brought with me today um, some bags of shredded currency. Um, each time I visited those regional Federal Reserve banks, I was given a bag of shredded currency. Um, there is a ton of currency that is shredded every single day because it is deemed unfit for circulation. Have you ever come across a bill that was ripped or fully torn in half? Those can be replaced. So at the end of every tour of that regional Federal Reserve bank, you get a bag of shredded currency that has been deemed unfit for circulation. So I brought with me bags of currency from those regional Federal Reserve banks for anyone to take a look at uh, after the end of the presentation. All right, so um, I thought this was a really interesting fun fact. So at the end of each day, the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank destroys $5 million worth of currency. That is kind of hard for us to wrap our heads around. That's kind of hard to fathom. That's a lot of money. And so if that amount is shredded, then that amount um, can be replaced with brand new, brand new um, notes. And um, 
when I first started teaching at SCF, this was probably my second semester uh, in my Principles of Macroeconomics class. And I guess I said this somewhere along the way, and a student thought it was pretty funny. And so at the end of the semester, this was the gift that she gave me. So it says, most people go on vacation to the beach. I like to visit the Fed. So these, these, these were words that I said at some point in class, and I just thought it was really cute that she actually took to, the time to do that. Ms. Zaborski, thanks for the memories. It's true. All right, so in terms of myths, um, a lot of us assume that the Federal Reserve System actually prints currency. They don't actually print currency. They issue currency, but they don't print it. So a lot of people think that there's a, a button at the um, Federal Reserve headquarters, and whenever they feel like it, they can just hit that easy button, and there will be currency that is printed left and right. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Could not be farther from the truth. So the Federal Reserve does not print money. The Fed issues money. So this is a, a, a word, too, that you can remember. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing is... Um, the department that actually prints the money. They're responsible for printing money, and I've toured the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C. Um, you can tour pretty much anything. It's all open to the public, and I encourage you to do that anytime you're visiting a city with a regional Federal Reserve Bank or if you go to Washington, um, D.C. And at the end of the tour of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, of course, they have a gift shop, and you can buy a fresh sheet of printed uh, dollar bills, of course, it's going to cost you $25, but it's, it's, it's um, really only worth, you know, like $5 with that sheet. So you're going to be paying more for the novelty of it, right, if you want to purchase a sheet of currency. So some facts about money. We all wish we had more money. Um, money's always on my mind. I don't know if it's always on your mind. So facts about money. Money is considered pretty much any asset that is used to purchase goods and services. Any asset. It could be physical. It could be financial, right? So money can virtually be just about anything as long as it plays these important roles in the economy. A unit of account. Whatever we decide to use and designate as our currency, as our money, it has to be easy for us to set prices for goods and services. If money was um, a cow... How would we equate buying a hamburger at McDonald's if our currency was that cow, right? So that would, that would make things a little bit difficult in terms of having a unit of account, a store of value, whatever money we decide to designate, it needs to be able to keep its, its value over long periods of time. It can't spoil easily and it can't be incredibly volatile. And also a medium of exchange. Is this widely acceptable? Is it used in the exchange for goods and services in the economy? So yes, money could technically be anything, but it, it really needs to play these three um, important roles in the economy. So as I said before, the Federal Reserve issues $1 bills, $2 bills, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, and $100 notes. Um, this is really interesting. And I was talking to someone prior to the, um, the session the largest denomination Federal Reserve note ever issued was the $10,000 note. Think about that just for a minute. Um, so there is a, a estimated lifespan for each of these denominations. Why do you suppose that the um, $100 bill has a longer lifespan than the $1 bill? Must be well older. Less people hold them. Um, we come across using um, $1 bills far easier and more frequently than the $100 bill. So I thought that was really interesting to share with you that there is a lifespan, an estimated lifespan for each of the Federal Reserve notes, each of those um, denominations. So can you imagine going to the drive through at Chick-fil-A? Yeah, sorry, um, all I have on me is a $10,000 note. Do you have change? I just want a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Just imagine that conversation. Um, so this is what it looked like. Very similar to uh, the currency that we have today. And notice we see D4. So D4, um, that tells us exactly which of those 12 regional Federal Reserve banks actually issued that note. Do you think there's a reason? Um, it, do you think it was a good reason to um, get rid of the $10,000 note? Or do you think we should bring it back? Change for a $10,000 bill? No, I'm so sorry. 
I've got change for five. <laughs> that doesn't really help. So I wanted to share that with you. There's also $500 notes uh, as well. Um, so these are just some of my favorite quotes about money. Um, never spend your money before you have earned it. I really like that one, Thomas Jefferson. Anyone who thinks money will make you happy hasn't got money. Um, money often costs too much. That's true. Too many people spend money they earn to buy things they don't want to impress people that they don't like. A wise person should have money in their head, but not in their heart. Oh. So there are um, three main types of money. So there's fiat money. And fiat money is what we have. Those are our Federal Reserve notes. Not many people in the economy know what our money is actually called. It's called a Federal Reserve note. It says so right on the note. But if you go um, to a restaurant, if you go through the drive-thru and, and, and you ask someone, yeah, all I have are Federal Reserve notes. Do you um, accept those, by the way? <laughs> Nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh, I'm so sorry, we actually don't take those. <laughs> So people really don't know what our currency is actually called, but it's called a Federal Reserve note. And so fiat money at the top left corner, that's the $100 bill. So fiat money is a currency that we use. What gives it official status is it's backed by the full faith and credibility of the US government. That's what we decide to deem as our uh, currency. And that's referred to as fiat money, which is kind of interesting. And then in the middle are silver bars. So that would be a good example of commodity money. So instead of actually having currency, we're actually using that commodity itself to serve as the currency. So the value of that currency is gonna fluctuate up or down with the value of silver. And then um, commodity backed money, which is in the, um, the bottom here. So this is commodity backed money. I actually brought some with me today to show you. So these are silver certificates. These are from um, the late 50s in the United States. Notice they don't say Federal Reserve notes at the top of those, um, at the top on the, on the front face of that, it says, a, it says a silver certificate. So that was the currency and it was at one point in time backed by the um, value of silver, which is so interesting. So, um, we stopped linking currency to gold in the 1930s during the Great Depression, but permanently moved away from um, uh, gold backing by 1971. Let's think about the reason why, because students are always so curious to know why we moved away from the gold standard. Does the value, does the price of gold fluctuate a lot? We assume that it only goes up. Does it ever go down? If you track the price of gold, you'll see that it actually fluctuates. And so um, it's in very high demand, it's uh, expensive, it's difficult to get your hands on globally. And so um, it was just too volatile. And so we needed something that was a, a little less volatile. So that sort of explains why we moved away from the gold backing. So thinking about the role of banks in the economy, the Federal Reserve is the bank for banks. We can't call up the Atlanta Regional Federal Reserve Bank and say, yes, hi there, I'd like to open up a checking or a savings account, please. They will say, no, I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to have to um, uh, find a commercial bank or an online bank that's member FDIC. We don't, do in, we don't handle individual accounts. We're the bank for commercial banks in the economy. So the Fed is the bank for banks. And their slogan is a lender of last resort. Have we ever heard the expression, too big to fail? I don't care for that expression, but the Federal Reserve really and truly only bails out the larger national banks in times of crisis. They would never bail out a small bank with one or two branches. They would let them fail or find a buyer to take over and the FDIC would get involved. But if we're dealing with Bank of America, hence the name, or Wells Fargo, or Chase, or Citi, then if we allowed those large national banks to fail, it would be catastrophic. So that's where that slogan, that phrase, lender of last resort, too big to fail, comes from. The Federal Reserve does not want commercial banks to call them up every single day and ask and beg and plead for a loan. They want to make sure that they are utilizing the federal funds market and the, the federal funds rate in the federal funds market. All right, so commercial banks do in fact play a, a crucial role in the economy. If we think about it, you guys, um, a bank is just another business in the economy. And we have to remind ourselves that businesses come and go, that businesses do in fact fail. 
Um, so the, the biggest role that commercial banks play in the economy is that they create money by issuing loans and charging interest off of those loans. Student loans, home loans, small business loans, um, car loans, all of the above. Charging interest off of those loans um, by issuing loans in the economy that provides um, and creates this positive money multiplier effect in the economy. So how banks are able to create money and issue loans is really heavily dependent on us keeping money in our checking and our savings account at the bank. If we decide to deposit money in our checking and our savings account, that provides uh, banks access to money to issue loans and to charge interest off of those loans. That leads to that positive money multiplier effect. Um, however, if we decide to withdraw our money out of, and close out our checking or our savings account, we are making it very difficult for banks to issue loans and to uh, create this money multiplier effect through the economy. So the Federal Reserve strongly encourages these commercial banks who end up falling short of their required reserves, which are the rules set by the Fed, to borrow from other commercial banks using the primary credit rate, the federal funds rate. So the Federal Reserve, as we've talked about, conducts monetary policy by either increasing or decreasing this primary uh, credit rate known as the federal funds rate. So um, let's review which type of monetary policy the Federal Reserve would use in which phase of the business cycle. So during a recession, the Fed would lower that federal funds rate to encourage banks to issue loans to customers to increase uh, money, the money multiplier effect. But in order to curb high inflation, hyperinflation, the Fed would increase that federal funds rate to reduce lending among banks and customers. So 20 years since 9-11, um, I think a lot of us remember exactly where we were and what we were doing on September 11th. So the one thing that we, we never really um, uh, considered thinking about was what role did the Federal Reserve Bank play um, uh, with 9-11? Um, so the events of 9-11 really challenged the infrastructure of the overall financial system. Um, Wall Street was targeted. That's where the New York Regional Federal Reserve Bank, just a, a one block over, that's the New York Stock Exchange. And so that's considered the financial hub of the United States. And so all over New York City, ATMs were running out of money. Why do you suppose people were, were so desperate to get their hands on currency? In times of crisis, if there's a hurricane, right, we like to get our hands on, on, on cash, currency, um, because we, it makes us feel a little bit safer. But banks were running out of currency left and right. They weren't ready for those mass withdrawals. And so the Fed acted very, very swiftly to flood the US economy with ample liquidity, with money, um, by lowering the federal funds rate significantly to free up money in the economy. So in times of crisis, it's true. Uh, we do want to get our hands on money. We want to get out of town as quickly as possible. Um, you know, we're no stranger to hurricanes in this part of Florida. I always like to make sure that I have uh, cash on hand to preparation for the, the category four or five uh, storm because um, a lot of places when the electricity is down, we can't use our credit or debit card, can we? We have to rely on cash. I remember going to a restaurant because I was without electricity after Hurricane Irma for um, 10 days and I, I was just dying for a meal out. And um, thank goodness I had cash with me because that's all they were, uh, that's all they were accepting at, at that time was cash. And I want to leave you with um, this. So I want to thank you for uh, attending the presentation today and um, leave you with just a little bit of economics humor.